Want to bet? Get in on the action at Sports Interaction. The boys of summer are back on the diamond and March Madness is on deck. Bet pregame, live in play, or on one of our many prop bets. Sports Interaction makes it easy to deposit, play, and cash out. Head to sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN or in Ontario, download the app now using the QR code at the bottom of the screen. 19 plus, please play responsibly. Welcome to SDPN celebration of International Women's Day 2023, where we sit down and chat about the impact of women in the world of sports. We've got a great lineup for you today, including discussions about athletes, management and coaching, and finally, women in media and fandom. And to kick it all off, I'm joined by Allison Lucan and Rachel Dory, who get things started, ladies. You both have had a fair share of your hand in women, women's hockey. Let's go over first. We'll start with Rachel. Rachel's the host and writer at the Hockey News. She hosts Staff and Graph podcast, which breaks down the finer points of hockey statistics and statistics, tactics and statistics. And I've just found out that you interned eight months at the CWHL. Yeah, um, I was doing like a sports business program at university and uh, we have to do this big internship. And so I... I had already kind of done one um, in men's sports, so I wanted to do my big one in women's sports. And so I reached out to the CWHL and I interned there for eight months. And it was weird timing because I was an intern there when the NWHL got announced. And so like, yeah, I'll never forget being in the office that day. It was absolutely wild um, just because like it kind of came out of nowhere. And so um it's just it's been so um interesting and also like really uplifting to see how like from the days when I was an intern at the CWHL and it was a league that like had a really good hold in um the women's demographic and now to see like how it's grown and how many more players are getting more opportunities and how much more the women are being paid these are fantastic hockey players and they're getting living wages, they're getting sponsorships, they're getting eyeballs. Um, and to me, like, that's so important and to see that growth of the game um, has just been, it's been fantastic. Like, you just, when I was working there, um, I had, it was kind of a pipe dream to say like, oh, this is going to be on um, a major sports network one day, or, oh, maybe the NHL will pay attention to us. And, and now it's at the point where, like, there's just so much going in the, and the momentum is there's, it's good for the development of the game. It's good for international hockey. Um, and it's really good just generally speaking in society because people are getting to see that um, women are capable of being elite athletes as well um, in sports that are traditionally dominated by men. So I just, I really love to see the growth and and where we've gone from when I was an intern in 2016. Yeah, you're you're like an OG. Like you, you were there in the beginning. And to take things like, connecting the dots we have allison lucan who is a sports writer on-air analyst on root sports southwest for the seattle kraken who called the rivalry series game that was in seattle allison you saw potentially the largest audience for a women's hockey game outside the olympics i want to hear your take on how far the game has come yeah, and I thank you for having me, and I apologize. I'm in an airport, so <laughs> there might be some background noise, but um, that game was so inspiring because I think all the time we hear there's no demand, there's no interest, and over 14,000 people bought tickets with children, with parents, with grandparents, men, women, people of all genders were there, and it was just so amazing, and I think to me, what's so important about the growth of the sport in terms of exposure is that I've seen hockey, women's hockey push the envelope of what hockey is, even more so than the men's game. Um, before I was in Seattle, I was in Columbus. And in addition to covering the NHL, I got to cover both the women and men's team at Ohio State, current national champions. I will remind you all. Um, I'm biased. I, I own it. <laughs> Vote Sophie Jakes for the Patty Caz. <laughs> we're done. Okay. But, um, you know, I think what's really cool is we were talking about this ev evolution of a very aggressive penalty kill. And we were talking about it in the NHL under the guidance of Brad Shaw and Columbus. But meanwhile, Nadine Muzerall was doing the same thing in the women's game. And it's become a much more accepted strategy in the women's game. And that makes the game more exciting. And even in the rivalry series, we're seeing Team USA go with 
two different power play formations based on the personnel they have out there, like that makes sense, right? Like, why do we always have to run one formation? Why can't we say who's out there? How can we maximize their benefit and keep the penalty kill on their toes? I just love that the women's game is pushing the envelope in terms of what hockey is, what it can be. And the more exciting this game is on all fronts, the more money we all make, the more exciting it is. And that's good for everybody. It's true. It's kind of like a cool, I don't want to say clean slate because there's been so much work that has gone into getting women's hockey to this point, but there's a certain fearlessness about women's hockey where we're like, well, if you're not going to let us into the boys club, then we're just going to do what we think is great for the game. And to your point, you know, the, the power kill, as we call it now, it's no longer, you know, the penalty kill, it's a power kill. Um, it's changing the way that the game is played. And part of that, of course, inherently due to the fact that it's not a body checking. Don't get me wrong. There's body contact, but it's not a body checking sport. So Rachel, I want to know from the hockey statistics side and tactics, you know, how you've seen the women's game develop and, similar to Allison, maybe give us a, a comparison to what we're used to seeing on the men's side. Yeah, it's it's actually really grown. We didn't have, like, even when I was at the CWHL, we didn't even have women's hockey analytics. Um, so it was really hard, like, everybody knows who the best players are. I mean, you're talking about, like, Hillary Knight, Marie Foley Pouin. Like, these are very obvious names. Yeah. But we didn't really have ways to evaluate players. And so, like, for now we have things like the ice garden and Mike Murphy does just incredible work in his group and collecting women's hockey stats. And so now we're able to actually evaluate players. If you look at what um, some of the people in the women's hockey landscape are doing with statistics, not only are they doing fantastic work, but they're also putting some of um, the names that aren't traditionally or weren't traditionally discussed in women's hockey at the forefront because people weren't realizing how good these players were relative to the likes of Poulin and Hillary Knight. And so for me, I look at this and I say, like, like Allison said, you can be more innovative. Um, usually, like, you want to try something. I mean, the women are going to do it first. One, I actually think that it takes a ton of skill to be able to execute um, a defensive structure when you can't hit. When taking away right. the puck from somebody and hitting isn't an option, you have to be better with your body position. You have to be better with your stick work. You have to be better with your gap control. And analytics can help measure things like that. And so um, for me, having access to women's hockey stats, like controlled exits, controlled entries, um, and like expected goals, but also like cross ice passes and, and shot assists, like these things are going to be super important as we grow the game. and to me that like that's where the value is because on the men's side i mean i don't want to have to get to a point where we're yelling and screaming about an analytics darling in women's hockey on twitter to the point where people are being crazy but it <laughs> would be cool to get to a point where we could have a discourse online based on women's hockey analytics and i think we're going in that direction and so for me that's been a that's just been such a positive because we see from a tactics perspective um Things being piloted in women's hockey, I mean, the behind the net power play was a big thing in Europe, but then I saw it in women's hockey. Um, we did it at York University um, while I was there, and then it was working for the women's team, so the men's team decided to try it. And so it's things like that where there can be a give and take. You can take things from women's hockey. Women can take things from men's hockey. And to see that kind of collaboration, I think, will be really good. And the other thing is I really – enjoy not even from an analytics perspective just from like on the whole my favorite thing right now in terms of like the growth of the game is when I see things like Sarah Nurse being involved in the NHL 23 like video game cover and when I see NHL players wearing um jerseys or t-shirts of the women's hockey leagues like to me that brings positive attention and then that brings eyeballs and now we have funding to do things like track analytics and and things like that. And so for me, that's, I think it's, it's all going in a really positive direction. Yeah. You guys are like way over my head on the analytics side. I like, we get our information at the PWHPA from sport logic and I'm like still trying to understand half the terms that they're using here. It's such an area of opportunity for, for women's sports, especially Allison. I want to, I, I do want to shout out the one third. You're the one third of too many men podcast. Got to make sure we get that plug in there. Um, 
when you're calling these games more on the softer side, because this is all new to me as well, what, how, what is your freedom or how do you approach telling the stories or, or, you know, dictating the story of the game to those listening at home? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, you know, when I've had the the opportunity and honor to call a women's game, it's very important to me that we don't fall into the easy cliches, the narratives. This is so-and-so's daughter. This is so-and-so's spouse. This is so-and-so's sister. Like these athletes are more than that. And I think, you know, to Rachel's point of things evolving, we have to look at what is different in this game and really pay attention to these athletes. I think that that's what a lot of media misses is they almost go too far in the, oh, it's hockey, so I'll call it like hockey. And they don't take yes. the time to invest and understand who these individuals are. I find that the athletes in the women's game are some of the most interesting humans to cover. They're my favorites, honestly. I've covered many teams, many years, and the women's athletes are always my favorite. They're wonderful. They're smart. They're witty. Their give a damn per 60 is not too high. <laughs> they don't say what they think. Um, and I think that a lot of times commentators don't invest the work they should to understand the differences in the humans and in the game. And that's where, you know, to what we've been talking about here, if you do that, then you can start to talk about, did you see what just happened there? Did you see what that athlete can do that no one else can do? Did you see what that power play formation was that no one else is doing? And so for me, I'm very intentional, <laughs> this is terrible, but to watch people who I don't love their call, to right. inform how I want to make their call. And I have to give a shout out to Erica Ayala, who's one of the best in the business. She's just so, so good. And just, again, I think this is why we talk about having space for women in all of hockey is that we have the perspective to know the stories that need to be told and how to tell them the right way. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you, Martin. I, I actually was just on a show with Erica earlier today. So I, I love that shout out as well. It's, it's something new for me, but and I struggle early because I'm like, how much do I want to sound like every other color commentator that we have? Meanwhile, during the Olympics and the World Championships, I'm sitting at home playing the how many times are you going to say Laura Stacey's great uncle is King Clancy drinking game? <laughs> like we've all, we all do it, right? So I think that's a great point. Uh, one final question I want to ask each of you. Um, I guess in your world, whether it be uh, analytics, uh, podcast, fan, or, you know, question mark of your role in the future of women's hockey what are you most excited about let's start with you Rachel yeah I think um I think women's hockey has the chance to actually be extremely groundbreaking and sort of I'm really sick and tired of people saying oh the men lead the way so like we need to do this I think the women can lead the way in certain aspects and one of the biggest aspects is the marketing and growth of the sport like Allison was talking about it with these athletes being so entertaining and so personable. I think that part of the reason women's hockey is going to start to really take hold is because the women are so personable. They interact um, with fans in a different capacity. They're not afraid to have a personality. And, and we see things like Kia nurse um, is on Kia Stan being a professional basketball player, but she has that personality. It's fantastic. Sarah Nurse, the same, Natalie Spooner, um, you as well, when you were playing, like, to have these personalities, like, it's, I think it's important because it gives fans a chance to really see that person for who they are and, and try and relate to them. Because right now, like, we don't, there's nothing in common with NHL hockey players because they don't show that personality, say, for a select few. And so I think they could really be a beacon of growth for how hockey as a whole is marketed i mean look at nella lapusanova like the girl is 14 and we should be doing everything we can to make sure that we're marketing um girls like her and then maybe taking that to the next level how are we marketing um different games how are we marketing a rivalry series whether it's at the college level um or at the professional level and so i think for me that's where it's going to be most exciting is the innovation in the level of the marketing of the athletes. I think um, we're going to see some, some new and fresh ideas and, and that gets me very excited. And I'm going to spin the question slightly because Allison, you work with the Seattle Kraken and in my head, new organization to the league, but very much at the forefront of, we don't want to be every other NHL team. So what are you looking most forward to in your experiences, you know, kind of twining those into the, your answer, maybe, of where women's hockey can go. 
Yeah. I mean, if you look back to that rivalry series game in Seattle was huge in terms of what the Kraken wanted to do with it. We had a panel with some of the Team USA athletes. We did a whole thing with bringing young women and young girls to the ice, to the game. Uh, we just had our women in hockey night at a Kraken game last night. And the Kraken are so effective at living these themes and not just slapping something on a jersey and something on a scoreboard. Um, but, you know, I want to go back to something Rachel said, too, when we talk about what's next, is I think what I want to see come next is using our platforms to put some of the foundational pieces in place for the women's game now. We're not going to know if Neela is as good as MPP in 10 years if we don't have the data. We're not going to be able to explain the intricacies of MPP to someone who's born in 10 years if they didn't see her if we don't have the data. And I think we need to continue to remind people to pay attention to this wonderful game and elevate it. And I think more specifically for me, something that has become a big part of what I want to do with, with my job is being a face of a woman on a broadcast that's an analyst and also making sure my language is always very inclusive. I want to give a shout out to Kevin Weeks, who always does this as well, but I'm never going to only say he or him. It's a her or him, or it's a they, because if a young girl is watching this game, they need to understand that there's space in this game for them to do whatever they want to, too. And I think bringing support to this game in terms of how we talk about it and then the data we record on it on all levels is, is what I hope, hope, hope is coming. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't have said it better myself, honestly. And as somebody who has, you know, recently struggled through the last four years to truly, you know, professionalize women's hockey and see it get to that next level, a huge gap for us is that we've lost our history. And in losing your history, you make the same mistakes. So I couldn't agree more in statistics, analytics, in the Hockey Hall of Fame. We need to know where we came from to continue to get better in the future. I think that's all we have time for. I feel like this could have been an hour episode. Uh, I appreciate you guys so much for taking time of your day, especially, Allison, you're at the airport right now, which is what we do on International Women's Day. We just overwork ourselves. <laughs> No, I, I appreciate you guys so much. And up next, stick around because Rachel's not done. She's going to be on to talk about women in management and coaching alongside Liz Hood and Kaya May. Later on the show, we'll hear from Sam Chang, Lauren Williamson, and Annie O'Donnell on the impact of women in media and fandom. This is SDPN's International Women's Day 2023. Stay tuned. Thanks, ladies. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of our International Women's Day broadcast here on SDPN. My name is Liz. I'm one of the Game Over Winnipeg hosts, so I've been working with the company uh, since this fall, where I do one of the shows that we have for all the Canadian markets. And I'm joined by Kaya today, who's also going to help me host, and we're going to be talking a little bit about women in management and coaching in sports. Kaya is one of our Game Over Vancouver hosts. Uh, so she's from out west, and we are joined by the wonderful Rachel Dory today, who you are all very familiar with, I'm sure, from this morning segment as well. So we're super happy to have Rachel join us today and super excited to get chatting. So Rachel, Kaya, how are you guys doing today? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Feeling very blessed today, getting a lot of nice messages and, you know, seeing a lot of great spotlights towards a lot of fantastic women in the industry. And, you know, obviously we want to celebrate them as often as we can, but getting some particular highlights today is awesome. And discovering new women in hockey as well is always fun, you know, learning about people who doing cool work that you didn't know about before. So it's been awesome. But uh, yeah, so this morning, obviously, we talked a little bit about uh, women in hockey as athletes and kind of how that looks and sort of some areas of change that we want to see there. Um, but we have Rachel today to talk a little bit more about the operations and behind the scenes things about uh, women and the roles that they currently play and sort of some of the issues that uh, we currently face in that realm of things. So, uh, Rachel, tell us a little bit about some of your experiences that you have in uh, hockey management, of course, of all things, and, you know, sort of what that experience has been like for you over the years. Yeah, so um, obviously been with a couple NHL teams, um, also done it at university level and in women's hockey um, with the CWHL. Um, it's been different everywhere I've been, um, but it's one of those things where, depending on where you are and depending on the environment that already exists there, um, that's kind of going to chart where you're going to fit in. And so, um, for example, at the CWHL, when I was there, um, it was pretty much all women. And so, like, everybody kind of had that seat at the table and everybody felt valued. And because we all knew we were from underrepresented, like, minority in hockey, um, 
I really felt like we were kind of building it and um, we all had to like work together and collaborate to bring out the best in each other. Um, whereas from like a, a men's professional standpoint, you always feel um, like you're trying to find your voice or like you're trying to prove yourself. Um, you have to be careful about what you say because it's very easy for people to tag you as being emotional or um, young or inexperienced or you never played the game. All of those cliches that got thrown out. Um, and so, yeah, like women are going to deal with that until it's the norm that women are working in men's professional hockey, specifically at the NHL level. Um, and there are some women who are doing um, fantastic work that have been sort of breaking that ceiling and and really pushing forward women in the NHL. And um, that's really great. But in terms of like how women are treated, like there's still, um, you could tell that there's, they like to say, oh, inclusivity and, and equity and, and all that, all those fun buzzwords. But at the end of the day, there's still work to be done. Um, we're going in a really positive direction, I feel. Um, but we still need to continue to push that envelope to where um, women are considered equal at that table. And just because you didn't play in the NHL doesn't mean that your opinion is not valuable or you don't know about hockey. Um, I mean, Scotty Bowman didn't play in the NHL. And last time I checked, he was a pretty darn good hockey coach. So to me, I look at that and I say, like, Women do belong at the table, um, in my experiences. Like, I've had some good ones, and I've had um, some ones that obviously I wish went a little bit differently. Uh, but for me, I look at it, and I say um, it's all part of the growth, and uh, the beginning is, is always going to be difficult. Um, it's never going to be easy, and the way I look at it is um, if it's difficult for me and, and I go through those difficult phases, maybe it's easier for somebody down the road, and that's really important to me. Well said. Yeah, kind of just, um, like you said, moving down the road, um, there's obviously positives and negatives uh, being kind of in this new era of inclusivity within the NHL. You know, they have the women's empowerment games, which are a new concept to a lot of teams. Um, what kind of changes do you think needs to happen um, on the internal side before, you know, externally there's more support? Um, I think teams can do a better job uh, and like the people within the front offices can do a better job of creating a, maybe a little bit more healthy of an environment um, for the women in the game. Um, sometimes, obviously, there are comments that are made that generally 10, 15 years ago probably would have been acceptable and, and now they aren't and not being afraid to call those things out, making sure that people feel um, comfortable when they're given a seat at the table because they've earned it um i also think we need to be careful um like misogyny is not gonna go away like in two seconds right that's something where work needs to be put in work needs to be done whether it's like external misogyny or internalized misogyny like there's a lot of work to be done and that has to be unlearned and to do that um there needs to be um I think the NHL needs to do a better job of kind of stepping in and, and having better diversity, equity, and inclusion training. I think there needs to be more accountability um, in terms of hiring processes. Like, you should not just be able to pick up your friend and hire them. Like, that's that shouldn't be a thing that happens. Um, I think that I'm seeing teams that are doing um, blind hiring, um, sort of using blind hiring tactics. So they're actually trying to get the best person regardless of what their gender or sexual orientation or background is. And I think that that's a really positive way um, to do that. But honestly, it's it's really about empowering and making the people feel welcome and valued in the roles that they're in. Because the, the problem that we have is right now, a lot of the women who work in hockey walk on eggshells because we know that there's, there's only a few of us. And if we mess up, like it's going to reflect badly on women, generally speaking, I mean, look at my Twitter mentions, like, it's wild out there. Um, and I know that you ladies get it as well. And so it's one of those things where the men need to be an empowering voice without overtaking the women. And the women who are also in hockey um, need to uplift other women as opposed to anything else. And so for me, 
Um, that's the biggest part of it is, is just making sure that everybody has the space to feel valued and empowered. Um, and honestly, like, I really think this goes for anybody, but like, if you're at a point where you're tearing somebody um, down, whether it's online, in the workplace, no matter like where it can be, like, that's not very productive in terms of working together. And so I, I think that there just needs to be more open conversation had uh, within front offices about um, how we can all be better in and more inclusive. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's really important for for people to sort of take some of that that onus to really um, empower themselves and work with the others around them and whatnot. Um, obviously, environment and things like that uh, play a huge impact. But for people who are out there listening, you know, who have interest in whether it be management or just moving upwards in hockey in general and stuff like that, what kind of advice do you have for people about what they can do themselves, whether it's uh, what kinds of support networks they can try and build, uh, conversations they should try and have, boundaries they should try and set for when they want to uh, break into the hockey world? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think generally speaking, um, you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's with everybody. That's with the men in the game who are clearly uncomfortable with women coming in because that's something that hasn't really happened. So they have to be comfortable having those conversations and comfortable dealing with the women. But the women who are trying to break in also have to be comfortable being uncomfortable because you are going to be in a room where you might be the only woman in that room. And inherently, like, that can be uncomfortable. And so what I would say is, like, you need to be strong in your own belief. You need to have confidence in yourself. Um, but you also should take the time to learn from other people around you. Don't be afraid um, to understand like when you're wrong or um, understand somebody else's perspective, because from a woman's perspective, we have a different perspective than the men do. And I think that, like that can be very valuable. And it, within the same token, the men have a perspective um, that the women don't have. And, and that can also be valuable. So it's about finding a happy medium and a balance um, to where everybody's perspectives are heard and valued. And then in terms of wanting to break in, I would say um, you have to be bold, right? So be active on social media, um, do good work that that shows that you do um, your research and you, you kind of know what you're talking about. Don't be afraid to um, join hockey communities where people have these interesting conversations, listen to podcasts, um, and, and reach out to people. Like a lot of people in hockey, specifically women, like obviously... I try and answer any woman that reaches out to me. I try and answer pretty much anybody that reaches out to me. Um, but you you want to build your network and you don't just want to have women in your network, but it's good to have women in hockey in your network. But reach out to people, um, like even at this network, people like Steve, Adam, Jesse, Andrew, like these people are allies for women. They, they uplift, they empower women. And so getting advice from them um, and their experiences and and really taking what they say to heart um, can really help you because um, there's no job that's too small to get started. And so taking that small, small step, that small leap of faith, you never know what it can lead to. Um, and so for me, it's just be comfortable being uncomfortable and, and don't be afraid to ask. There's no dumb questions. Uh, very well spoken. Very good advice. Uh, just want to ask another question. Um, you mentioned working in the CWHL, which was primarily women um, for front office and all of those operational roles and everything. Um, do you think that there's anything that the CWHL, that what they were doing over there, that the NHL could apply um, for promoting inclusivity? I think, first of all, that's a fantastic question. Like, I think there's so many things that the NHL can learn from the women's game. Um one, inclusivity is, like, a huge part of it. Um, but two, like, access to athletes. Like, the women are marketed so much better than the men are. And I think that that's an area where it's it's not only an opportunity to learn from the women. It's an opportunity for those women to get jobs within um, men's hockey as well. There's nothing wrong with being a marketing consultant for men's and women's hockey. And I think if we got some of the personality in the men's game that we got in the women's game, maybe the NHL salary cap would be a lot higher because um, people would, I don't know, I guess feel like they can relate to these athletes. Whereas like you have somebody like Sarah Nurse or um, Kia Nurse in basketball or 
um, Natalie Spooner, uh, Liz Knox, like all of these personalities are, are really, really important. And to me, having a young up and comer, somebody like Sarah Fillier, um, really promoting her personality. I think that men's hockey can can learn from that. The other thing I think the NHL, quite frankly, and front offices can learn from, and I mean, this has been a, a really touchy subject lately, is the Pride Nights. If you're going to have a Pride Night, do it properly. Do not have a Pride Night and advertise like three things and then only do one of those things, right? And if you look at how women's hockey does it, right, there are um, trans athletes in the women's game and they're allowed to use whatever pronouns they so choose and their chosen names. And, and so for me, if the women's game can do that, there is nothing wrong with wearing a pride jersey like wearing a pride jersey doesn't say i am part of your community in the same way that wearing a military jersey doesn't say i'm part of the military wearing a pride jersey says i support your rights as a human being and that's it and so for me i think from a, a dei perspective the nhl can learn a lot from how women's hockey does things like Black Lives Matter and Pride and a lot of the, the social issues. I think men's sports as a whole can learn a lot from um, how women do that because frankly, like they're not doing enough and they are the leaders in the space, in the sport, and it's incumbent upon them to make it a more inclusive environment. And you know what? I If, if a player doesn't want to wear the Pride jersey because it goes against their belief, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that nobody else should wear it because just because one person on your team doesn't want to do it, why should you prevent anybody else from supporting the cause? And to me, I think that's where the line should be. Yeah, absolutely. I think women definitely have that, you know, like all the things that you've mentioned, that perspective of being the one who's who's left out, being the one who's undervalued and things like that. So they understand the importance of the simplest acts of recognition and welcoming and things like that. So I think that those are um, really tangible areas that the NHL can improve. Obviously, you know, you can say things that, that are broad, like, do this, do that for women. But I think those are definitely actions that are small, simple steps that could do so much to help grow the game. So I think we're kind of going to wrap up this final segment here. Um, we have another fantastic segment coming up after this one. Um, but before we wrap up, I just kind of wanted to ask everyone in the room a quick question. I'll ask you first and then I'll answer it myself to give you some time to think because I'm putting everybody on the spot. Um, but this morning we talked a little bit about athletes and this evening we're going to talk a little bit about women in media and fans and content creation in that type of area. So in other realms of hockey where women exist, uh, who are some of your role models and some of your favorite people to follow on Twitter or read their work and things like that? Uh, I can start and I'll say that one of my uh, favorite idols in hockey is Megan Chaika. I know that um, a lot of people in the SDPN space are probably familiar with her. Megan does a lot of fantastic work. She's on TSN now doing some stuff um, uh, all connected to her work at Stathletes. And she's a woman in analytics, which is something that uh, you know, I admire greatly because I think analytics are a really untapped space in hockey that is growing every day and having a woman be a trailblazer in that area is super, super inspiring for someone like myself. So um, Megan Chick is one of my favorite people to follow because she's also unapologetically herself. You know, a lot of women, I think, sometimes feel the need to, um, you know, conceal some of their femininity or be someone they're not to, when they want to try and fit in a men's world. And Megan is just one of the greatest people to follow to you know show that you can be yourself and you know you can be a smart beautiful woman and you know kick all those glass ceilings um away and shatter them completely so uh Megan's one of my favorites Kaya what uh who would you say is someone that you admire in the space of of different areas of hockey um I say someone that's coming up later on the show Annie O'Donnell um personally a huge fan of her TikTok um just kind of promoting especially in like the Southern California market especially where she is with like Anaheim and all that, um, it's kind of a different market to it to compared to like what I usually follow up in Canada, um, as well making content that's relatable for hockey fans, engaging hockey fans um, through social media. I know Liz, you do this as well with uh, on your TikTok, but it's kind of just engaging more people and also making the game relatable for other women who are interested in the sport and want to get to know it more um just through a fan lens I think it's quite interesting yeah totally Rachel yourself yeah so um both of you took two people that that I really like I like Megan a lot she's a really good friend of mine um 
and Annie, um, her and I have become fast friends um, because we, we have that struggle on TikTok together. Um, but she's fantastic. Um, to me, um, some of the other people uh, that I really value, um, I really like Allison Lucan and Shana Goldman. Um, I think they're really um, breaking that, that glass ceiling. Um, Emily Kaplan as well. Um, I think she does a fantastic job um, with how she's kind of taken on this role with ESPN and, and, and shown that, that women do have a place in hockey. Um, Megan sort of does it like on the team side, but I think Emily does it really well on the, on the media side. And so for me, um, those are women. And then um, I would say uh, behind the scenes, um, Cami Granado is somebody that I will always look up to. Um, I think like she's just absolutely fantastic. And so um, I look at that and I say, um, there are so many women um, that we can look up to and somebody on SCPN, Sam Chang, um, the, the way that she kind of goes about it and, and, and breaks down um, barriers in hockey, not only for women, but for other marginalized communities, um, I think is extremely important. And so for me, it's more about um, unlearning some of the stuff that I learned growing up in, in the community of hockey and really learning how to be um, as inclusive as you possibly can so that nobody feels like they're unwelcome in this game. Um, and so uh, those are people that, that I look up to that I think do a fantastic job. Absolutely. And, and there are so many more, and I'm glad to see so many people highlighting some of their favorites today, and we'll continue to do so in the later segments of this show. Uh, that kind of wraps up everything that we wanted to touch on today. Thank you so much, everyone who's tuning in and listening to the show thus far. It's really important to continue to support different projects like this um, to, you know, um, give lots of voices and space to share their thoughts and on these important days and also on all 364 other days of the year. So, Rachel, Kaya, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your day today, out of your special International Women's Day. I hope you are getting financial compensation for men being the worst. <laughs> um, on social media platforms to you both so um, we will continue to you know uplift each other uplift all the other women in hockey and if you're you know uh, a woman in hockey yourself listening to this and you're whether a, a woman in hockey as a young fan or some other kind of professional you know um, girls help girls we're all here to help each other out when it comes to this sport because we know it's a little bit of a daunting place sometimes so um, never be afraid to reach out to women that you want to, you know, add to your network or that you want to uh, develop relationships with and all those kinds of things, because there are a lot of fantastic women out there and that presence is only going to continue to grow in hockey. So take care, everyone, and we'll see you in the next segment. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Samantha Chang. I am a co-host of the broadcast and a Game Over co-host. I'm here with Lauren Williamson and Annie O'Donnell. Uh, and we are here to celebrate International Women's Day. Uh, happy International Women's Day. Thanks for watching. I assume you've watched the first two segments. Uh, we are the last segment, and we're here to talk to you today about women fans in sports and women in sports media. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Annie to introduce herself. Thank you, Sam. My name is Annie. I am a content creator. Uh, I guess my good friend, uh, Clark over in Saskatchewan has coined the word fanalist, uh, which I've kind of coined a little bit. And I can, I guess we're going to talk about that a little that. bit more, but um, <laughs> I know I was like, I'm part fan, part analyst there. Um, done podcasts, things like that, but just overall a sports content creator have built a decent following on TikTok, And um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> and 50,000 followers is nothing to shake your head at Annie. Don't undersell yourself. Oh, okay. Girl. All right. Well, um, <laughs> And oh, for I'm those... gonna bring it up, but <laughs> you're, we're here to pump ourselves up, Annie. Come on. Okay, um, you're right. You're right. It's International Women's Day. You're let's right. Go. I'm the let's worst. Go. At that if there too. was ever a day to not be <laughs> humble, today is the day. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Lauren Williamson. I am one of the co-hosts of Game Over Toronto on the SDPN network. I have been a Leafs fan for a long time, and I am brand new to the sports media environment. And I am excited to be here with these two fine individuals to talk about some of the challenges that we face every day, every time we stream, every time we post, every time we get one of those Twitter replies. So I'm excited to have both of you here today and uh, and to talk about this topic. Yeah, so why don't I kick us off? Um, let's. I was going to say, why don't we start talking about how we got into, I guess, sports fandom slash media? Like, Lauren, I feel like I'm pretty new to the sports media. I actually still on a day-to-day -day basis do not consider myself media. Like some of the replies are like, you call yourself a journalist. I'm like, I have never referred to myself as a journalist or sports media. 
Right. So no. Right. Um, but for for me, I've been a hockey fan my pretty much my whole life. Um, but I kind of moved. I became a Twitter user. Mm. Prolific tweeter, compulsive tweeter, really, really need to tweet less. I like prolific. Prolific is better. Yeah, prolific tweeter. Yeah, um, fancier. Yeah, yeah, and kind of like was tweeting through my Canucks feelings. Met some awesome women on Canucks Twitter. Uh, shout out to my broadcast co-hosts Georgia and Mallory. And kind of around the time that the Brendan Leipzig DMs leaked and were oh, super misogynist. Um, yeah. That kind of was what spurred the creation of the broadcast. Um, we wanted, we were looking at the coverage of the story and I was like, all of the people writing about this are men. Like all of this coverage is from a very male gaze. Mm-hmm. And there was really nothing out there. We were just, at the time it was myself, Mallory, Georgia, Danny, and Vanessa. And we were talking about how we wanted to create something that was like listening to your girlfriends talk about sports. And that was just like less serious, more fun. We threw in the segment at the start, which was like name five players, like based on the trope of like every reply that's like, oh, you're, but you don't even like hockey, name five players on this team. <laughs> so we used to do like the most outrageous name five players, like name, name five players whose like partners are better athletes than them. So like Morgan, Morgan Riley, Riley. Yeah, first name <laughs> that comes to mind. Um, So that's really how I kind of pipelined from fan into like media and then started doing some other podcasts and web shows, but that that was my pipeline how about you guys Andy go ahead um so mine was a little bit more unconventional well I guess kind of in that same realm starting as a fan I knew I wanted to get into sports knew I always wanted to work in sports but I remember feeling like the media side was like too big of a dream for me to reach so I was like well I'll just do the business side you know and I would literally apply to jobs like through and through get foot in the door, everything that they tell you that you need to do to get a job in sports. And it just wouldn't work out like every single time. And at that point I was like, cause the universe trying to tell me something like what is going on here? And I was getting so fed up, but I knew that I didn't want to work in sports. Like I just love, love talking sports. And I, I kind of use the phrase that like sports is my love language and it's how I create connections with people, all the places I've lived and everywhere I go. And I finally kind of thought, I said, you know, listen, if there's, you know, no light at this tunnel, if there's doors closing, I'm going to build my own damn door. So I launched my own podcast, OD on Sports, back in 2019, where I would just ramble. And I was like, I just need somewhere to just put my thoughts and we'll just see what happens here. And then from there, kind of kept doing the podcast throughout COVID. Um, we had to get real creative with some topics, but even with like the labor dispute you know the start of the season all that drama going on there was still stuff to talk about but I also got on TikTok in 2020 and was just playing around with doing informative videos and skits and things like that and really it started to take off really at the near at near latter half of 2020 I had a lot of misses if you scroll all the way down to my TikTok and there's some rough ones but I keep them there to keep me humble to remind me where I started so um was able to build a decent following just it's been well it'll be about three years now and it's been a a slow consistent building but still it's been so much fun and such a fun app to play around with and I even got back on Twitter as well and was tweet live tweeting actually live tweeting through a Ravens Browns game I know I know we're talking hockey here but you know Ravens Browns game and Matt Marchese over at uh, Sportsnet 590 the fan noticed and invited me on to talk about football and I said hey you know, this is so fun. I'm also a huge hockey fan. Uh, would love to come on and talk hockey. And he's had me on plenty of times and even the Jeff Merrick show a couple of times. So it's, it's so funny how it all happens. Even my connection to a SDPN is Jesse followed me on TikTok and he messaged me. He was like, Hey, would love to have you on my show to talk some football and talk sports. So it's uh, my, my path into sports media has really been just, you know, build, build your own damn door, put your ideas out there. Cause you never know who's going to see them. You never know who's going to resonate. And um, yeah, there's a space, you know, if people say no, find your own way to say yes. A hundred percent. And not okay. even building your own door, kicking the wall down first and deciding I'm going to put a door here and then building the door for yourself. What an awesome way to damn start. Right. Damn, damn right. right. Damn right. Damn right. <laughs> and so for myself, if you, if you don't know where I came from, uh, like I said, I was just a Leafs fan up until about eight months ago. I'd been a longtime listener of, of 
the Steve Dangle podcast, of course. And uh, I had seen what they had done on Game Over and I thought, wouldn't that be a cool thing to get into? But I have no experience doing any kind of blogging or anything like that. I have been a Leafs fan for almost my role well, for my whole life. Um, a bit dodgy there in the mid 2000s, but we don't talk about that. Um, and then <laughs> they put out a post at the end of the summer saying, hey, we're going to be starting Game Over uh, in all of the cities and we're hiring. And they already had a game over crew. And so I wasn't even going to apply, to be totally honest. Actually, if you if you look at the submission, I had the video hidden on my YouTube channel. I didn't submit my video until the last day because I just thought there's going to be 10,000 Leaf fans, at least, that listen to the Steve Dingle podcast that are going to send a video. And how many of them are going to have more knowledge and they don't want to listen to some like random girl that lives in Etobicoke and... I just didn't think anything of it, but I sent the video again, not thinking anything of it. And lo and behold, like 48 hours, I have, I have an Andrew Berkshire calling me on the phone and I'm like, I, uh, I don't know what this is about. And it's, it took off from there and it's been a whirlwind ever since. And ever since I've gotten started with it and I've been lucky enough to get my foot in the door with SDPN, who was gracious enough to give me the position and, you know, what a great team to be a part of, honestly, because you know, not only are they supporting, you know, like the LGBTQ, LGBTQ2 plus community, they're supporting women, they're supporting BIPOC, the BIPOC community, they're supporting the Indigenous community, and the doors that have opened up to me by working with SDPN just in the last six months, I didn't think was even, was even, I didn't think it was even in the cards. I didn't think that card existed because I've been a Leaf fan my whole life, but I didn't go to journalism school. Like I didn't study. I didn't get, I don't have a bachelor of arts from any college or university. Like I grew, I actually was working in another male dominated industry in cooking for 12 wow. years before I changed industries. Wow. So I'm not new to like being a small, like a small voice in a very loud room. So that's not new to me, but it's, you know, the Twitter slander is a new thing, right? Because now instead of just just going to work, now I have an opinion and I have a platform that I am responsible for that opinion for. And I am responsible for the things that come out of my mouth and and for the image that I present to the company that has been so gracious to hire me. And the pressure that comes with that and the imposter syndrome that has, has subsequently happened, which has now subsided, but first happened when I started getting into this. I mean... I think we can all talk about the experiences of having imposter syndrome and, and all thinking there's no way that this is my life because I have no qualifications and somebody else is more talented. But I think it's important that we give ourselves the opportunity to say, no, 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 I deserve this space. And I think kicking our own walls down and, and building our own doors and making space for ourselves is only going to make our building even bigger and stronger. Yeah. To your point about imposter syndrome, I mean, it always annoys me when someone else says it to me on the topic of Twitter slander. Whenever like somebody comes and is like, you don't know what you're talking about. You've never played hockey. You've never picked up a hockey stick. I'm like, first of all, like, you don't actually know me. Like, well, how is that a response to anyone? Like, did you know them when yeah. they were five, 10? Like, how do you know what their lifetime activities are? But also just like the automatic assumption that for women fans or frankly, for non, for anyone who's like not a cisgender traditional white male fan, that you don't know anything. You're a new fan and the automatic criticism um mm. it always gets my gets me riled up on twitter and i i'm probably less careful than most people about how what i say um i tend to have like a trigger finger um in terms of pushing back murder by words is what i like to say it's awesome i, yeah. I, I think i have days where uh, my day job is i'm a, i'm a lawyer um you can't really like always say what you want to clients or to like opposing counsel. And so like, I think all that pent up like snark, I just use on Twitter with like <laughs> random dudes in my replies who I feel deserve it. As you uh, should. You're using it for good, not evil. It's exactly. Yeah. I I appreciate that. I think I'm going to, I'm going to characterize it that way too, but definitely the, so I, I don't really get imposter syndrome when other people say it. When other people say it to me, I'm like, no, I know what I'm talking about. It really just kicks in myself when I'm like sitting on a panel, like on zone time, I'm on with Avery, who's another game over host, Julian McKenzie, Arun Srinivasan and TikTok Tobar. And every time I'm sitting there, I'm like, I followed all of these people before I started podcasting. Like these people all actually work in media. Like they can break down a play better than I can. Like even 
honestly, the thing that stresses me out the most is probably game over. Like hosting every show, I'm sitting there being like, I don't know how to break down this game. Like, I'm just here for the vibes. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I just like, and that I have that anxiety every time. Like it just, I'm like, do I know what I'm talking about? And it's like not a great feeling, but um, I do love that the platforms that we're all on and like the community that we're building is so supportive and like there's no one out there who's like you don't know what you're talking about everyone's always like yeah you're great you're so smart like love what your content is like Lauren I had no idea you only did this eight months ago like you're such a natural like it just oh I just fake it no idea (laughs) that's life that's part of the content is just faking it till you make it oh that's and here I am the confidence (laughs) I have three new jerseys three new jerseys in the last three months because all of a sudden I am now a podcaster and I need to have banners that doesn't exist. Like if you watch the first game over video that I did, none of this was here. I had to get different curtains because my sister yelled at me and went, if you're going to be on YouTube representing female Leaf fans, you can't have your house decorated like that. I'm not even exaggerating. <laughs> and, you know, I think, I think it's important that we're able to make that space and that even though sometimes that imposter syndrome does happen for ourselves, because even there's been times where I'm talking to anybody that we've worked with, or even some of the guests that I've had. And I'm like, why are they asking my opinion on this? Because I'm just, I'm just some person and they're, they do this and have done this for the past 15 years. And it's, it's, I found that as time goes on, I'm getting more used to it. And I'm, I'm sort of emboldening myself to the idea that you know, maybe it's uncomfortable because we don't really see a lot of people like ourselves that are hosting podcasts like this, right? Like Annie, right. I can't imagine there's too many like female Anaheim Ducks fans that have their own podcast and their own TikTok talking about hockey. And that's not all you talk about is the Ducks, but like that's a niche market. And maybe, maybe you don't, maybe we don't see it today, but maybe, you know, in a couple of years or maybe even right now, there are, there are young Anaheim Duck fans that are like, well, I didn't think that I could ever get a job in sports media. Like, I don't look like anybody on the TSN panel, but I look like this person. Honestly, that's my, when it, the best feeling, and I, I don't know if you two can attest, I'm sure you could, but like the best feeling is when you get a message from a young girl, either somebody in high school or asking either for advice or just saying you give me the confidence to embrace my love of sports and just own who I am and just rock with it. And I'm like that, if that's my legacy, I will be thrilled, but kind of continuing on the, continuing on the imposter syndrome here. It happens to me so many times. And it's usually when I like, know I want to talk about something because I'm listen, I'm a Capricorn. I'm like, I need to be on point. I need to be every, every bullet needs to hit. I want to make sure that nobody can argue with, with any of my points and any of my analysis. But the thing is someone's always going to find a way. Like there's always going to be somebody with an opposing viewpoint or just with a dumb argument. That's just like, no, you're wrong in your comments. You don't know what you're talking about. There will and always be point, someone like, asking for the five names, name five players. Exactly. Always somebody. Um, there's always going to be people that think you're not enough and, but you can't make content for those people. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the mindset I try to go into it with. And especially on TikTok, where sometimes it's just a cesspool. Like you either get, comments from like the guys wearing the sunglasses in their car in their profile picture that have husband father christian as their Always. as their bios or like 10 year old boys who are dumb yeah. and think misogyny is cool so and think it's funny so it's just you gotta you know, filter those guys out but yeah it's you know if i can i don't know i try figuring out a way to put more into words here but it's I understand maybe I'm more niche. That's probably why. Like you see a lot of the bigger teams, like uh, the Bruins creators do really well. You know, the Toronto guys do well and things like that. So, but I mean, I'm a hockey fan from Southern California. I'm a hockey fan from a non-traditional market. And I believe passionately that hockey can work in places where it doesn't snow and below the Canadian border. And I, that's why I'm a big fan of that. Hockey can work in Arizona. I'm, I've always, I'm, I know there's a new rivalry between the Ducks and the Coyotes as of the last year, but I am a big fan of keeping that team in that city. And I advocate for that, but I will, you know, I, I, I gotta be true to myself. Cause at the end of the day, when you make content, when you put your ideas out there, like you want to make content that you want to see. And when you're genuine to yourself and what you believe, like it's going to reach the right people and it's going to reach and create the platform in the community that you want. Cause yeah, you want number, like everyone kind of puts out, like, you know, for platforms, they're like, Oh, I want to get more followers, like quantity, quality over quantity always like, 
always it's about creating that great community around you of listeners of followers whatever rather than like having a bunch of them and you know nobody really knows who you are nobody really knows where you stand on certain things or cares about your opinion at that matter so kind of rambled there but <laughs> no, no you're doing, that. that was great you're, that was great I'm I'm with you I love having uh love having non-traditional markets honestly the best game I've ever been to in person was uh Vegas Golden Knights first year in the playoffs against the Winnipeg Jets I mm. flew to Vegas I uh, we got to tailgate it's like 40 degrees out you tailgate outside T-Mobile and then you go in what and you a- watch a hockey game it was glorious that's like, wild that have- oh the open the open container policy too yeah are you talking about winnipeg or vegas vegas yes <laughs> okay i was gonna say i was like does winnipeg have an open container policy <laughs> okay we're back um wouldn't be an sdpn segment without me having technical difficulties i think i started my first five game over shows with the with the live chat being like we can't hear you we can hear the guests but we can't hear you like oh, every no. single time you're like yeah <laughs> And I'm all, like, it's so stressful. I was like, I remember running OBS and just being like, I am not equipped to deal with this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted to go back to something Annie said that really resonated with me. I think um, one of the things that's been really great about having this platform and growing it and being in this community is like, for, I think we all see the like trolls and like the mean comments on YouTube videos or like even just in reply to tweets or like you said your your TikTok replies are a cesspool um but those are all kind of made worth it I think getting DMs or hearing from from people who are like I I never felt like there was anywhere in this sport for me to talk to people or to like listen to no podcast for me to listen to to feel connected to the community and like you've really created a space where I can feel like I enjoy my fandom like to me that makes such a big difference and like the idea that somebody out there is watching the stuff we do listening to us and thinking hey I can do that someday like that's totally doable like I used to I actually did want to go into sports journalism at one point and I just remember thinking I think the only women I remember seeing growing up were like Hazel May on baseball and then like Jody Vance covered the Canucks for a while but there really weren't a lot of women on TV there still aren't um, and so I think like all these, the proliferation of fanalists and TikToks and like SDPN and independent fan podcasts has been so great for, for people who otherwise would have been like, Hey, I just can't get into it. There's no space for me there to be like, Hey, I can do this. And like, that's been such a big motivator for me. Definitely. Definitely. It also breaks down that barrier that I think in sports is just so problematic is that you need a college degree in order to do certain things or like even the whole unpaid internship thing that I know is, you know, everyone's still talking about, but like, you know, the fact that it is classist to offer unpaid internships in sports because not everybody can afford to live at home and then just work for bear for nothing for internships or even just getting into the sports getting into sports you have to be willing to take a below paying job but nowadays like there's just so many different avenues to break into especially in media like if you want to start a podcast do it you want to start making content videos blog I don't know if people are still blogging these days but if you want to blog you can do it or if you just tweet like there's so many people that have gotten full-time jobs in sports just because they've been putting their ideas out into the world. And I think that's just the most amazing thing because, you know, I know you guys are of the same mindset, but the hockey's for everybody. Sports are for everybody and it should be accessible to everybody. Well, and maybe it's not, it isn't available for everybody right now, but that's where we're trying to get it to be. Right. And that's why we're doing streams like this. And that's why it's important that while we talk about the cesspool and how bad it is, boo cesspool, we also talk about the good things and all of the good messages that we do get, because I know that you've both said that you've received DMS. I've had comments on some of the YouTube videos. I've had people reach out to me on Twitter And sometimes it's not always nice, but a lot of times it's people being like, hey, I really appreciated that you had this view. You know, it's it's not every day I see somebody like me or I see in in my case, I see somebody in the in the queer community or I see I see a woman being able to like dunk on a guy and just slam him with sports facts because it flies in the face of all these misogynistic stereotypes that are sort of built into a lot of the systems in major sports. And I think that 
you know, I think it's important that we're able to, that people like you, Annie, and companies like SDPN and some of the other great companies that are out there that are encouraging and, and wanting more women in the sport and wanting more equality across sports, across the board, not just in hockey, but in soccer, in basketball, in volleyball, in rugby, in, in bringing and elevating the women's sport up to the level of where the men's can be, because we all know that we all watch it. Like anybody that says they don't watch anybody in Canada that says they don't watch like the women's Canadian metal, metal hockey game in the Olympics is lying because they all do because we all love women's hockey. And isn't it, isn't it a great thing that now these, walls are slowly starting to be torn down or there's doors being built for people because people that are brave enough to start their own TikTok like you, Annie, who, like you said, you think it's a niche market, but 50,000 followers is nothing to shake your head at. And that's only going to keep followers in three years. Right? <laughs> yeah. Ridiculousness. And, yes. you know, maybe we don't see the the effects of this now, but, you know, I think that these are the moments where the changes are happening and we don't even realize that we're part of this machine that is crushing and breaking and shattering the glass ceiling that is. So that is going to wrap it up for the end of the uh, women International Women's Day stream. Uh, I would like to thank all of the people that were on today's videos. Uh, Liz Knox, Allison Lucan, uh, Rachel Dory, Liz Howd, Kaya May, Lauren Williamson, Annie O'Donnell, of course, and Sam Chang. Also, extra shout out to Corella Mard and Maud from Game Over Ottawa. Um, we wish you were able to be here with us today, but we're glad that you were able to be part of our family and to have you on this stream. Annie, I know that you're not part of the family yet, but we're slowly adopting you. So just deal with it. It's going to be great. I so, accept. Absolutely. I accept this adoption. I love Proudly. it. Well, well, we're going to have STPN streams in all kinds of markets, including Anaheim one day. So, you know. Yes. So let's finish off the stream here. Uh, I am Lauren Williamson. You can find me on TikTok at Lauren in the Six. You can also find me on the SDPN YouTube channel hosting Game Over Toronto on most nights. Annie, go ahead and pump your own tires, girl. All right. You can follow me on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram at Sweet Annie OD. And I do have a podcast, OD on Sports, that's on a bit of a hiatus, but hoping to come back sometime this spring. But Actively active, act, actively active, Jesus, active on social media uh, every day on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, I'm Sam. You can find me on Twitter at Samantha CP and on the broadcast and on SDPN Game Over Vancouver and on Yahoo Zone Time. I promise I'll have a face there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, we, and we will see you all the next time we do any of the game over streams thank you for watching please make sure you hit like and subscribe if you like this content make sure you leave any comments and thank all the women in your life that you are thankful for and if you're a woman in sport or you're wanting to get into it girl don't give up carve your own door game over powered by sports interaction canada sportsbook